ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience and holding. We now have your presenters in conference. Please be aware each of your audio lines is in a listen-only mode. You may submit your questions electronically at any time by using the chat pod located on the bottom right of your webinar. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's first presenter, Mr. Chris Hund. Thanks a lot, David. Hi. Good morning or good afternoon to you, wherever you are. Uh, this is Chris Hunt, uh, Director for Clinical Quality at the Health Research and Educational Trust. I'd like to welcome you to today's monthly Team Steps webinar. Uh, this is on IPASS, uh, and Integrating High Quality Handoffs into Team Steps and Hospital Care. So just a few, mo few rules of engagement here, and I'll be brief, but um, you could access the audio for your webinar in two ways, and this is important. If you're listening to the uh, webinar via the phone number that we gave you, please make sure to click off the little speaker you see in the top of your screen. Otherwise, you'll get some feedback, like when you call into a radio station and, and hear yourself. So just make sure to mute that computer speaker. Uh, or you can listen directly through your computer and you don't need to call into the phone at all. So it's your choice, really, what you want to do. Uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Uh, they are, there are going to be a lot of people joining. There already are a lot of people joined. And so if we don't get to all of your questions, what we'll make sure we do is we'll make sure that we, we sit down with our presenters for today and uh, do our best to get everybody's questions answered and then post the questions on the website, Team Steps Portal, Dot org at the end of the day, or not at the end of the day, sorry, uh, in a few days, so that you can uh, be able to see uh, the answers to your questions. To that point, we really encourage you to use the chat box to enter your questions in. This way we can capture all of your questions, number one. Uh, number two, it also helps us to be able to kind of order the questions for the Q&A session to see if there are questions that follow a same thematic line that we might want to try to clump together uh, when we get to Q&A. So, so we really uh, encourage people to use that chat button for the Q&A. If no one uses the chat box, uh, we might open the lines at the end uh, for audio questions, but since folks often use the chat box, that's where we'll, we'll source our questions from. Uh, this project is sponsored by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Uh, thanks to uh, Jim Battles there and to Heidi King from the Department of Defense for their continued support of all the Team Steps work, both with the military and the civilian worlds. Like I said, I'm Chris Hund. I'm a member of a, a rather large team here at the Health Research and Educational Trust that does all kinds of work, not only these webinars, uh, and we also, uh, thanks to Impact International, uh, Dr. David Baker and uh, Andrea Amadeo for all of their help as well. Um, we, uh, as a part of the Team Steps program, offer master, offer master training courses, uh, which you can come to our website and look into if you're interested in attending. We also offer master training courses for uh, primary care medical offices, ambulatory type settings. Uh, we have a lot of webinars. We do a monthly one, and we have them scheduled right now through September of 2015. Um, and we also have an annual conference, uh, which I would assume many of you have already signed up for. We are actually, at this point, we are uh, starting a wait list for the conference. We have filled our registration, but people often drop out. So if you're interested in joining the conference, please uh, put yourself on the wait list. It's going to be in Denver, Colorado this year, June 16th through the 18th. So for all of this, if you're interested, head over to teamstepsportal.org. Uh, any questions you ever have about Team Steps, be it content or logistics about how to come to a training, email there, arcteamsteps at aha.org, or we have a phone number that you can call. All of this is available on our website, of course, if you need it. So, um, I promise to go fast to get to our presenters. Uh, today's presenters, uh, two gentlemen, Dr. Christopher Landrigan and Colonel Clifton Yu. Uh, Dr. Landrigan is 
from uh, the research director at Boston Children's Hospital, also works uh, as a director for a sleep and patient safety program at Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, also in Boston, and is associated also as a professor of medicine and pediatrics with uh, the Harvard Medical School. Um, and uh, Colonel Yu is uh, the director of graduate medical education at Walter Reed and is also an associate professor of pediatrics for the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences. So uh, two very distinguished guests we have here today to talk about their study. I'm really looking forward to hearing from them, and so I'm going to turn, them over, turn you over to them now. Gentlemen? Thanks very much, Chris. This is uh, Chris Landrigan. again. So, I will um, start start off by speaking a little bit, and then Cliff and I will go back and forth uh, over the next period of time, talking about different aspects of our project. So, what I'm going to what I'm going to do is start off by talking about just some background literature, very briefly, on handoffs, miscommunications, and patient safety, and then that will lead us into a description of uh, the IPAS study that we've been conducting over the past several years. Um, both the development of curriculum as well as the results of the analysis and investigations themselves. Um, just by way of disclosures, I have done a little bit of consultation around this work. As we'll get to towards the end of the program, actually, we do offer um, IPASS consultations to institutions that are interested in doing them. Um, there are some copyrighted materials in this from the IPASS study group, um, but we have permission to use them. Um, so I'll start with very broad background on patient safety, which I'm sure to this crowd is pretty familiar, but just to remind you, um, really we've known about the epidemic of patient safety in the States for about 15 years now um, with the Institute of Medicine's original report back in 1999 to Errors Human, where for the first time I think it was recognized that medical errors and deaths and injuries due to medical errors were happening at a really epidemic level uh, in this country, and for the first time major efforts were made by the federal government and others to begin to stem the tide. Um, unfortunately, as we look about 15 years later, um, we still have a major problem on our hands. So Office of the Inspector General just in 2010 reported that there may be as many as 180,000 deaths each year among Medicare beneficiaries due to adverse events, which um, even if you were to assume that no one else in the population is injured, this would make medical errors about the third leading cause of death in the country. Um, but, you know, those original numbers... Uh, from the Institute of Medicine's report and the more recent numbers from the Office of the Inspector General are very difficult to compare for a host of experimental reasons as the methodologies have shifted over time a little bit. And so um, I was part of a group uh, a few years ago now that did a study in North Carolina trying to track changes in rates of harm over time in that state. And as you can see from the discouraging looking graph there, at least at that point in time, we weren't seeing a whole lot of evidence of improvement either. Um, although more recently, there has been at least a little bit of a hint in some disease conditions and um, in some in some types of medical errors that we're beginning to see some change. But you know, really, any way you look at it, this remains a major problem um, where there's a lot of a lot of need to have further improvement. Thinking specifically about um, some of the root causes of these things, one of the major sources of concern over the past decade or so has been the work schedules of providers, uh, providers in training as well as nurses and others. And um, I was involved in some work a number of years ago looking at the effects of sleep deprivation on resident physicians. Uh, we conducted a randomized controlled trial at Brigham and Women's Hospital where we found that when hours were reduced for interns, the rates of serious medical errors dropped off very significantly really across different types of errors that we looked at. Um, but, you know, in trying to implement this change, it became very apparent uh, very early on that we had a problem with, with handoffs. In fact, I think we'd had a problem with handoffs, the communication between residents at changes of shifts that had been around for a long time. But as the shifts got shorter, in response to this intervention, we were having those transitions occur more frequently, uh, whatever problem was there at baseline was exacerbated to some degree. And so while overall, nevertheless, we saw an improvement with reduction in hours, um, it began to occur to myself and a lot of colleagues here that we need to start uh, doing something about this problem. In 2008, trying to take a fresh look at the problem of residency organization, the organization of academic medical centers in the state, the Institute of Medicine conducted a year-long review where they convened experts and reviewed the world's literature on this topic. And really fundamentally at that point in time came to the conclusion that the literature was sufficient to suggest that it's unsafe for residents to work for more than 16 hours in a row without sleep. 
And this um, ultimately led to the ACGME doing its own review of the problem and concluding that at least for interns, our first year residents, the, um, the hours should be capped at no more than 16 hours in a row. But as both the Institute of Medicine and the ACGME looked at this problem, they recognized that it was not just a question of reducing hours in isolation of other factors. There had to be some effort to ensure and monitor structure handoffs, as well as to do a bit to improve uh, supervision so that we could make sure that residents were handing off effectively and that they were competent in the skill set and so forth. Looking at uh, data from, in this case, the Joint Commission, the Department of Defense, by the way, has very similar data. Um, when you look at the root causes of the most serious errors that happen in hospitals, so-called sentinel events, where, for example, the wrong kidney comes out during a, a surgery or there's a tenfold overdose with morphine that leads to a patient death, um, in analysis after analysis, communication rises to the top of the heap as the, one of the root causes of these types of events. And when you drill down into these a little bit further, it turns out that more than half of these communication failures are a frank handoff problem between one provider and the next, where, where there's simply a failure to transmit some critical piece of information or um, the wrong piece of information is transmitted. Um, when we train our residents about this, we now have a whole host of videos. These are available on our website, um, which we'll show later on, but it's ipasshandoffstudy.com, or you can just search IPASS Handoff Study on, on Google, and you'll find us pretty quickly. Um, there's a whole series of videos and so forth that we've developed, um, largely under Cliff Youth Center, um, as he'll describe in a few minutes, to train folks um, in these things and to, and to sort of look for some of the problems that we were seeing at um, baseline handoffs. But suffice it to say that as we looked at our own handoff problem here at Boston Children's initially, we saw lots of variability from one provider to the next to what was being transmitted, lots of tangential conversations, a failure to prioritize, a failure to be explicit about um, how ill patients were and sort of what, uh, what things might go wrong and contingencies and so forth. Really, in other words, a whole host of just kind of organizational problems with the way that handoffs were being conducted. And, you know, at that point in time, we had the sense that, um, that this was a complex process. So as we began to take a look at it, uh, handoff really consists of multiple interactive components. There are, in most systems, typically um, both a verbal handoff and a written handoff, a written sign-out document that's, that's passed off between one provider and the next. These things overlap to some degree, but they are almost never um, exactly the same, and, and in general, that's by design. You often want more in the written sign-out than you've got um, time to convey verbally, but, but they should be complementary in some fashion. All of this is, of course, happening within a certain uh, unit teamwork environment and within a particular hospital with its own culture, and, and all of these things are potentially targets for intervention as you are thinking through ways that you might try to make the handoff process better. Um, as we began to focus in on what the best approach might be, we came to the conclusion that it would be better to tackle multiple avenues simultaneously rather than just to focus in on one of these elements as a possible route to success. And in many respects, this really was informed by other successful patient safety interventions. For example, some of the interventions to reduce hospital-acquired infections, where um, approaches to reducing catheter-related bloodstream infections uh, focus not just on hand-washing, but on hand-washing, the optimization of sterile barriers, the avoidance of the femoral site, for example, the removal of lines as quickly as possible, and several other you know, small interventions. The idea that by bundling together several small evidence-informed interventions, there's a better chance of success than just by focusing on one of these things as a silver bullet. So we really tried the same thing. And, and the core of our initial pilot intervention at Boston Children's was to provide a little bit of communication and handoff skills training, which was built uh, in large part uh, off of the Team Steps program. Um, we also introduced a mnemonic, a standardized structure for the physicians to use at change of shift to kind of keep the, keep the handoff organized in the same way every time. We redesigned the verbal handoff process in many respects. We, um, for example, there were several things we did, but, but one of the biggest was we had our first year residents, our interns, signing out to the interns in one conference room. And at almost the same time, we had the senior resident signing out the same set of patients to the senior resident who was coming on duty in a different conference room just down the hall. And um, it took a little bit of logistical rejiggering, but we essentially got all those folks to come together and created a team handoff, which we ultimately found was much more effective. And then we... And then we took this, this structure that we had for handoff and started building it into our electronic medical record system. So there was this constant reinforcement there for the residents. And when we studied the effects of this intervention at Boston Children's, we found really dramatic drop-offs, both in rates of medical errors as well as preventable adverse events, which are injuries due to medical errors. 
um, both of which were pretty significant, and that was published in JAMA in 2013. Um, but, you know, although this was a, um, a really successful first effort in, in some respects, it was also quite limited in others. It was just a single site study. We weren't really sure at that point if this was going to be a generalizable type of, uh, type of an intervention. We had time of year issues to contend with just given some of the structure of the, of the grant funding and the limitations of that initial analysis of this. And importantly, we found that um, the intervention itself was not really very well sustained beyond the first several months that we were really heavily focused in on it. And so with a lot of feedback from the frontline providers, from the resident physicians who were using it at that time, we refined many elements of um, what ultimately ended up being the IPASS handoff bundle and then began thinking about how could we extend this to involve more centers and be a, a higher quality, more professionally graded intervention. And that's what took us to, uh, to creating IPASS. Um, IPASS has been a multi-site project that's involved um, centers from around the, around the U.S. and one, one site in Canada as well that have been interested in improving handoffs of care. And um, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Cliff. I'm going to describe that a bit. Okay, thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, so as uh, Dr. Landrigan mentioned, uh, my name is Colonel Cliff Yu, uh, the Director of Graduate Medical Education as well as the Principal Site Investigator uh, for the IPASS study here at Walter Reed. And um, so I'll go over in the next 20 minutes or so um, the actual study uh, intervention and how that was uh, developed. Now, uh, so once the decision was made, um, as Chris mentioned, to expand the scope of the study to the nine different study sites, uh, we also took the opportunity to refine and more methodically plan and implement the intervention as well. Um, so what ensued was a large and complex collaboration of educators and researchers uh, from the various uh, sites of the study uh, that worked to develop the intervention over the time course over a period of um, a little over a year. Now, this slide shows you the various components of the actual IPASS handoff bundle. And um, what we did was we, we kept the, the main components of the bundle that Chris outlined in the pilot project, namely the communication training, uh, the verbal mnemonic, and the computerized handoff tool. But these elements were further revised and expanded to include the creation of a new verbal mnemonic, uh, which I'll go over with you in, a, in some detail in a few minutes, as well as the more focused uh, team training that we developed. Uh, all of these elements were introduced into an interactive resident workshop, uh, which included simulation exercises, and which I'll also talk more about later on, and also a faculty development program to familiarize the attending staff with IPASS, um, which also includes training in how to do handoff observations and provide feedback to trainees on their actual handoffs. And finally, we developed uh, an institutional campaign to promote the use of the new handoff methodology uh, throughout the study units uh, that were involved. So um, given the recognition that uh, you know, Team Steps is the gold standard for team training um, in the healthcare field, we felt that we uh, should continue to utilize the uh, Team Steps uh, part of the curriculum uh, as was done in the pilot study but that would really focus the curriculum uh, uh, for the multi-center study to focus really on uh, communication techniques. Um, so what we decided is that we would extract the seven key communication strategies that we felt were going to be most relevant to transitions of care and overall team communication and then focus on those specifically um, in the curriculum. And I'll skip over this slide, obviously, since I understand most of the audience members are already familiar, pretty familiar with the, the Team Steps program. But I did want to point out... Um, that, uh, you know, regarding the individual Team Steps communication components, um, you know, I, I'll start off by saying that the mere concept of including multiple members of the healthcare team in the handoff process was actually a new one at most of the study sites. I think most of the study sites, um, historically, as we've all done um, over a number of years, as we gave the handoffs one-on-one -on -one from provider to provider. So elaborating on the very idea of the multi-team system that is articulated in Team Steps um, in the context of the overall team communication we felt was particularly important uh, conceptually. Now, we also emphasized very early on in the curricular intervention the idea of the shared mental model being the ultimate goal of any team communication strategy uh, to include the patient care handoff. So in terms of situation monitoring, uh, situation awareness, and finally the shared mental model itself, uh, they become the key concepts that we want them to understand and to use as part of the team communication vernacular, uh, which we use quite frequently throughout uh, the, the remainder of the training. 
Now again, um, we quickly move on to a discussion of the seven individual team steps techniques uh, which we introduced with a short explanation, an illustrative video vignette, uh, followed by a short group exercise similar to the official team steps curriculum uh, and the use of the trigger videos. And uh, so we start off. Um, with uh, the brief as an important technique that we point out can actually be used at the outset of the formal handoff in order to gain situational awareness amongst all team members before the official sign-out process even begins. And then the video vignette, which we use to prompt discussion of how to, the brief could be best utilized in the resident's uh, current clinical environment. Next, we introduce the debrief, which is emphasized as another key technique that if used routinely can uh, optimize process improvement in real time. And then we follow that up as well uh, by a trigger video. And the next is the huddle, which is defined and discussed in the context of regaining situation awareness when things have changed, such as an alteration in the clinical status of a patient after the handoff has already occurred, uh, and when team members therefore need to ensure a shared mental model uh, before they move forward. And, and then this is the next trigger video. By the way, since the initial IPAS study, um, was performed in pediatric hospitals and services. These videos were um, that we developed were pediatric specific, but now that we've actually developed a whole new series of videos, um, uh, which are now more generalizable, as Chris had mentioned, um, these are available, uh, you know, uh, as well for broader teaching, uh, broader teaching audience. Now, the uh, next communication strategy we cover is cross monitoring and feedback, which, as most of you know, emphasizes the ongoing process of team members watching each other's back and providing ongoing feedback to improve team performance. Uh, we try and emphasize the point that this can occur at any time that team members are working together both during and after uh, the actual handoff. And again, here's the video uh, vignette that goes with that. Advocacy and assertion emphasized through the team members is a technique that empowers any member regardless of their position so the team uh, on the team to voice their concern when they perceive a patient safety issue is at stake. For example, during a patient care handoff when the wrong information is being transmitted or uh, during a procedure that is being performed incorrectly. And uh, this particular video shows a spinal tap being performed in a baby where the medical student questions the uh, correct insertion site of the needle uh, with the intern. Then uh, check back um, is the uh, next one. And we like to emphasize it as the method used to ensure closed loop communication through verification and validation of the information exchanged. And um, of course, this is, we all know, is a key component of team, commu team communication strategy. And we specifically incorporate it, actually, into the handoff mnemonic uh, that I'll be uh, describing in just a few minutes. And then lastly, we talk in much greater detail about the handoff itself as a team communication technique exemplified specifically in IPASS. So uh, before delving into the IPASS mnemonic, we first like to discuss the global elements of effective handoffs that apply to both verbal and written forms of handoff communication, uh, specifically emphasizing not only the transmission of accurate information, but also the transfer uh, of authority and responsibility as well. So uh, this is where we usually cue the uh, drum roll as we introduce the actual IPASS uh, verbal mnemonic. So here it is, um, as you can see, um, the I is, uh, is for illness severity, the P stands for patient summary, A for action list, the S, first S is for situation awareness and contingency planning, and the second S uh, stands for synthesis by receiver. So just as a side comment here, um, the uh, mnemonic that was uh, chosen to be used in the pilot study that uh, Chris referred to was actually side out. Uh, which at the time was one of the few out of the two dozen or so published mnemonics that had any evidence base uh, behind them. But despite this fact, it was interesting, the feedback from the pilot study participants in Boston Children's uh, was that it was hard to memorize and operationalize, and in fact, in the majority of the handoffs during the intervention period, uh, it was observed that the mnemonic was not actually used. Um, so development of the de, de, de novo IPASS mnemonic that we created was therefore initiated with subsequent input from the residents in the pilot study as well as with key members uh, and of the IPASS research team. So the ultimate goal was something that was going to be shorter, uh, easier to remember, and that included key elements that observing faculty in the pilot study often felt were lacking. Uh, for example, um, an illness severity assessment, uh, contingency planning, and some form of readback uh, by the recipient. To confuse things even further, uh, the use of the term IPASS to describe our handoff project actually predated the creation of the actual handoff mnemonic. 
So the IPAS mnemonic referred to originally stood for the two, institution, uh, the two initial sponsoring institutions, in other words, the Institute for Innovation and Pediatric Education. Uh, the P stood for uh, the Pediatric Hospitalist Research Network, uh, known as PRIZE, or Pediatric uh, res Research in Inpatient uh, Settings. And the remainder of the mnemonic referring to uh, accelerate, accelerating safe side outs. So that's what IPAS originally referred to in terms of the project. So as the IPAS handoff mnemonic was developed, it became clear that this would be much uh, catchier and easier to remember, and not coincidentally would also end up mirroring the name of the study. So um, let's uh, go over each individual component of the IPAS mnemonic, and I'll start off with uh, illness severity. Um, and why we feel this is so important. So to really gain that sense of situation awareness and a shared mental model that we discussed in the team communication section, uh, it's absolutely critical that all team members have a mutual understanding of what the sickest patients or who the sickest patients are and where the attention needs to be appropriately focused. So although the language used to define these categories may vary by institution, we introduce a simple graded system of, classif uh, of classification as shown in this next slide. And the categories specifically are stable, uh, watcher, and unstable. And for many providers, uh, the watcher category may be a new term, and so we describe it uh, explicitly as referring to those patients who are at risk of possible um, imminent deterioration. So by definition, an unstable patient should either be in an area with the highest level of monitoring and care available, uh, such as an ICU or on the way to getting there. And we also like to emphasize that this is a determination we'd like to make at the time of the actual handoff since, we, as we all know, changes in patient status are uh, actually quite fluid. The next element of the handoff is the uh, handoff pneumonic is the patient summary, which is one of the most important elements of the entire handoff process, and the one component that takes the most uh, cognitive skill and pres uh, practice to master. And so uh, a good patient summary feel needs to be succinct, uh, yet rich and descriptive, and uh, as um, part of the IPASS curriculum, we define uh, five major sections of the effect, of effective uh, patient summary, uh, as these that I show here on the slide, as being the summary statement, the events uh, leading up to the admission, the hospital course, ongoing assessment, and the actual patient care plan. Now, to start off with, the summary statement is the one-liner that sets the clinical context and contains key identifying information, such as the name of the patient, age, the gender, pertinent past history, and the reason for admission. The events leading up to admission section includes the chronological order of events, the essential history components, and any pertinent physical exam and lab findings. And ideally, this section should be in bulleted format and can ultimately truncate, be truncated when a high level of diagnostic certainty is attained. The ongoing assessment, uh, assessment reflects the critical thinking and diagnostic reasoning or thought processes that are related to the problem or diagnoses. For example, the giver of the handoff might say, this patient's left liver pneumonia is not improving clinically, so I think we should need to move to a, a thinking about a complicated pneumonia with a fusion, or perhaps we need to expand our antibiotic coverage. So again, it allows the giver of the handoff to explain the thought process behind the management plan. And then lastly is the plan itself, which ideally should include a specific plan for each problem or diagnosis, which would be uh, otherwise known as a problem-based plan. Or in some critical services, like in many ICUs, they may prefer to do a systems-based plan organized by anatomic systems. So again, this can be adapted specifically for the individual critical service uh, that is involved. So putting it together, a good patient summary, uh, we feel, allows for both the giver and receiver to attain a shared mental model, uh, helps to transmit concise information as well as responsibility uh, for the patient, includes unique features of the patient's presentation, and we use rich language in the form of semantic qualifiers to ensure high quality. Now this next slide helps us define uh, what for many is a new concept, and I'll just take a couple of minutes to define the idea of the semantic qualifier that I just mentioned. So semantic qualifiers um, are used to provide vivid descriptions uh, that allow uh, physicians and clinicians to conjure up mental images about the appearance of a patient. They also provide a characteristic pattern uh, of presentation that can facilitate pattern recognition. So for example, a child with development of swelling in the right knee over a two-day span can be rephrased as a two-year-old with acute monoarticular swelling of the right knee, which would give the mental pattern perhaps of a septic arthritis to a pediatric clinician. Likewise, a 
patient with uh, bouts of upper abdominal pain over the past six months that come and go becomes an adolescent female with recurrent intermittent epigastric pain. So this clinically concise and patterned language should be used as much as possible. We encourage its use in the actual handoff, uh, and particularly when communicating the patient summary. And we give uh, the participants actually a chance to practice this, practice this in the workshop as well. Now the third element of the IPASS mnemonic is the action list. And the action list is essentially a, a to-do list with specific attention to timelines, a level of priority, assigned responsibility, and, uh, and um, dating, and, up to da and updating, excuse me. For many, it can be uh, conceptualized best as a series of checkboxes, as in the slide indicating the to-do items for a patient who happens to have uh, sickle cell disease. The next element in the mnemonic is S, for situation awareness and contingency planning. Now, like the patient summary, the expression of this component requires a somewhat high level of cognitive skill. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, we introduced the concept of situation awareness in the team communication section as it applies specifically to the entire team of patients, in other words, the big picture. Now, in this section, we apply situation awareness to the individual patient in the context of this is what is currently going on, but also planning on what needs to, what needs to happen if something changes in the patient's current status. So this is where contingency planning comes in. It's basically planning for what could go wrong and then enunciating that plan should that change actually occur. So for example, if the patient spikes a fever greater than 39 degrees centigrade uh, tonight, you should obtain blood and urine cultures and start antibiotics. So that would be the specific enunciation of the, of the uh, contingency plan. Um, so this section provides the receiver with specific instructions for what might go wrong and then ensures that the accepting team or provider is prepared to anticipate those changes and respond to those events or changes in patient status. So another example would be articulating what the code status of a particular patient is or giving the parameters for when to start supplemental oxygen in a patient with uh, breathing di difficulty, for example. So in a nutshell, it simply can be explained by the phrase, if this happens, then you need to do this. And certainly for a stable patient, um, it's perfectly reasonable for the giver to say, I don't anticipate any problems. And finally, the last component of the IPASS mnemonic uh, is the second S, which stands for synthesis by receiver. As I referred to earlier in the team step section, this is where the check back comes into play, which is rephrased for the purpose of the mnemonic as synthesis by receiver. So basically, it provides an opportunity for the receiver of the handoff to restate the essential information in a cogent summary and de uh, demonstrate that the information was received and actually understood. So the example we frequently use, um, and I think is sometimes used in team steps, is when you order food at a Chinese takeout restaurant and the person on the other end uh, reads back your order in a concise summary. So we like to think of it as the ultimate communication tool that helps to ensure a shared mental model has been attained between giver and receiver of the handoff. I also want to emphasize that it's meant to be brief and is not a word-for-word -word summary of what was actually said by the giver. In other words, it's not a restatement of the entire verbal handoff. So that's the verbal mnemonic in a nutshell, and, um, and I wanted to talk uh, just a little bit about the printed handoff document that is supposed to accompany the verbal handoff. So in the year 2015, I think most all inpatient clinical services have some sort of uh, printed handoff document as well. So these can exist um, in the EMR itself or on a Word or Excel uh, document or some other format. But what's important is that the printed handoff document allows the receiver to follow along as the verbal handoff is communicated. It also provides more comprehensive information than what is presented normally in a verbal handoff, things such as medications, allergies, the room number of the patient, and other demographic information. So it's really a, a vehicle for efficient information transfer that can include information that would be due, otherwise too cumbersome or inappropriate to uh, put in the verbal handoff. The printed do uh, handoff document can also serve as a backup for the uh, verbal handoff and vice versa. For example, you may forget to verbally communicate something that should be done overnight, but if it's present on the written document, the receiver can ask about the task uh, that he or she sees on the written document. Omissions we know are a common problem during handoffs, and the written handoff tool adds to the redundancy, uh, which can be protected against adverse patient events. Um, and uh, also, in the IPAS study, each site was actually allowed the flexibility to design their own written handoff tool based on unique institutional requirements and formats. And all, are, but nevertheless, all were actually organized to reflect the IPAS mnemonic, 
with sections for each of these five areas to be filled in on the actual templated uh, document. So uh, the fourth component of the handoff bundle is the resident workshop, um, which was designed as a three-hour curriculum containing the core elements of the team communication uh, skills training, as well as an introduction to the verbal mnemonic and written handoff document. So the first part of the workshop lasts two hours and was designed with adult learning theory, uh, theory principles in mind, such as frequent use of trigger videos and discussion, interactive exercises such as writing out and verbally articulating patient summaries, and then rounded out by an entire hour dedicated to role play scenarios where the residents get to consolidate their skills as givers, receivers, and evaluators of the handoff process using the iPass mnemonic, uh, the written handoff documents, and the observation tools. To augment, this, uh, to augment this workshop, we also developed other curricular competence to include an online just-in-time training module to reinforce the skills just prior to when the residents rotate on their inpatient rotations, given the fact that the timing of when they participate in the three-hour introductory workshop may be remote from when they start on their ward rotations, so that essentially allows them the opportunity for them to get a, a little refresher uh, prior to actually um, working on the inpatient unit. And for the faculty, we have a one-hour workshop that reviews the iPass handoff techniques and then more specifically focuses on the observation tools that they are asked to utilize in order to evaluate the handoffs. Now, by the way, direct observation and evaluation of handoffs is now mandated by the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education in all of its accredited programs. So that adds increased weight to this particular aspect of our intervention. So we also show them videotaped handoff simulations so that they can practice with the observation tools before actually using them to evaluate live handoffs uh, with the residents. And here's uh, just some examples of the observation forms that we utilize to evaluate the giver of the handoff, um, the receiver of the handoff, as well as the written handoff document. And these were developed specifically for the study and were pilot tested and revised multiple times to demonstrate and confirm uh, tool validity. And then finally, we realized that one introductory workshop or education section would not nearly be enough to make IPASS known across the study sites or even let alone uh, within our own institutions. So we were very conscious of coming up with multiple ways to communicate the vision and the ultimate goal of IPASS with colleagues, uh, trainees, nursing, allied health, and senior management. So in addition to branding with the uh, IPASS logo, we made sure that every provider received a pocket card with the essential elements of IPASS that they could stick in their coat or shirt pocket. We also made iPass posters to disseminate throughout the units involved. We printed computer reminders that attach to screen frames, uh, made flip charts with the specific ISAP, iPass tips of the day distilled from the larger curriculum, and even distributed fortune cookies uh, that we had made up with iPass tips inside, as well as other novel ways to get the message out. And as a key part of the curricular intervention, we developed a number of visual examples of what uh, right looks like uh, as Chris uh, talked about, and we have now gone on to create multiple specialty-specific examples in our library of video vignettes, which we uh, can't show you here, but would be happy to share with you should you want those on request. And now I'll hand it back over to Dr. Landrigan to uh, finish up with the discussion of the larger IPASS study results as well as our ongoing plans for nursing dissemination. You might be on mute. Oh, thank you very much. Sorry, I was indeed. No, uh, no. So, so I was just going to talk for a few minutes about the um, the objectives of the study of the effect of implementing the IPASS curriculum that Cliff described. Our primary goal was to measure, as in the pilot study, whether introducing this led to a significant reduction in error rates and preventable adverse events. Um, but we also wanted to look very carefully at how it affected the processes of care, both the written and the verbal handoff communications, as well as what happened to resident workflow. Um, in particular, we were concerned about workflow because really the only source of pushback that we encountered around potentially introducing this, um, this curriculum was the idea that, well, sure, this may be a good idea, but um, as a resident, I'm so strapped for time that if this takes more time out of my day than I'm currently spending, I'm not sure that there's any way that I'm going to be able to pull it off. And so we wanted to look at both um, how long the handoff process itself took as well as what the impacts were on other workflows uh, throughout the 24-hour cycle. The design of this study was um, really a waived intervention study in the sites that were involved, which you can see listed uh, over on the left-hand side of the slide there. 
Um, we started in a couple of sites in California and then sort of moved our way um, largely eastward as the study progressed, where we did six months of baseline data collection in each site that was followed by a six-month period where the intervention was introduced and got up and running and matured. And then we did six months of post-intervention data collection um, that was matched by time of year with the pre-intervention data collection so that we didn't have any issues with uh, learning effects or time of year confounding. To measure medical errors, we used a pretty intensive methodology that's based on um, some of the work that we've been doing for years to look at medical errors and adverse events that um, at its core really involves a research nurse who on a daily basis reviews all the charts on the study units, also debriefs uh, both the residents, all the residents who were post-call received a standardized form every day to report any events that they may have encountered. Um, research nurse also went in, around to unit nurses and got reports from them about what may have taken place, gathered up formal hospital instrument reports and so forth, really to try to be as comprehensive as possible about gathering possible adverse events and errors. And then anything that's detected um, through any of those methods was uh, coded and reviewed by two physicians who were blinded as to whether this was detected before the intervention or after the intervention and at which site in general. Um, we then uh, looked directly at audio recordings of a random sample of verbal handoffs from before and after the intervention and downloaded a random sample of written handoffs so that we could evaluate um, as objectively as possible presence and absence of key elements for communication. And then to look at what happened to resident workflow, we did something called time motion analysis, which basically involves hiring um, a team of research assistants across sites who followed the residents around for, their, for a sample of their shifts throughout the day and night, throughout the weekdays and weekend days, um, and monitored moment by moment exactly how they were spending their time. So they looked at how long the handoff itself lasted, but um, importantly, they also looked at things like how much time was being spent at the computer, how much time was being spent at the patient bedside, and then subcategorized those activities, as you can see on the slide. To analyze these things, we did a plus on regressions um, where we tried to control for both uh, site level effects and clustering as well as other potential covariates. And what we found in doing this is that really across the board things, um, things improved. So in a review um, of about 200 handoff sessions, about 2,000 unique patients, we found really across the board that the quality of what was being transmitted verbally improved significantly in, 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 every, in every measure that we looked for. Uh, likewise, when we looked at the written handoff document, we found significant improvements in all nine of the elements that we were looking for um, before versus after the intervention. And, you know, certainly some of these elements, both in the verbal and the written handoff, did not reach 100%. Um, in some cases, not even particularly close to 100%. And so there's certainly ongoing room for improvement. But really across the board, things got at least to some degree better and in some cases uh, dramatically better. And then most importantly, from a patient safety standpoint, we found really significant reductions, as in the pilot study, in rates of both overall medical errors as well as preventable adverse events, which were, again, those injuries due to medical errors. Um, those fell off about 30% from 4.7 to 3.3 per 100 admissions. Um, as a so-called falsification outcome, we also measured the rate of non-preventable adverse events, which were things like a first-time reaction to penicillin in somebody who had no previously documented allergy. Um, really to make sure that um, we wouldn't expect those things to have changed with our intervention, but we were measuring them anyway just in case um, to, to make sure that there was nothing that was funny that was happening, of which we weren't aware, and those as expected remain stable. And then in looking at our balancing measure, resident workflow, we found that there was really, after thousands of hours of observation across sites, there was really no impact on resident workflow. So the amount of time spent in direct contact with patients and families was not changed. The amount of time spent at the computer was unchanged, and the duration of handoffs themselves was, was really essentially identical. So in other words, whatever the synthesis and the various other elements and structures that we were adding added um, was, was, was perfectly counterbalanced by the efficiencies created by streamlining some of what the residents were doing, and I think by getting rid of some of the tangential conversations that were happening more frequently at baseline. As we, as we developed the program, um, we began to be approached by some of the nurses, initially at Boston Children's and then at some of the other sites that were involved as well, saying, well, you know, this is great for residents, but do you think that this will be useful for nurses as well? We likewise have a problem with our handoffs and can potentially benefit from some structure. And so we began forming a team to work on iPads for nurses um, as well and developed a number of nurse-specific training materials, written handoff tools, and video vignettes uh, for that um, for that population of healthcare workers as well. Um, 
And then we engaged in two small studies to take at least an initial look at how this worked. Both of these were uh, at Boston Children's, and one of them also involved Lucille Packard, which is one of the other IPASS sites, where we um, began using IPASS for nurse handoffs, either at change of shift or as patients move locations within the hospital. For example, going from the emergency department up to the floors or from the operating room up to the ICUs. And as we did so, um, we found, as was reported in, in the journal Pediatrics about a year ago now, that, um, that the use of IPASS was associated with maximum score for sustained improvement in handoffs. Um, you know, really across sites there were improvements in, in a number of institutions, 23 institutions that were involved in this collaborative. But um, the two sites that were using IPASS uh, were some of the highest scores in the group. And when we look specifically at our own data from, from Boston, we found that the incidence of nurse handoff-related care failures fell really dramatically, um, particularly in the ED to inpatient unit transition, but, but also across the other types of transitions that we were evaluating to a lesser extent once they started using an IPASS structure. We also did, as we had with the residents, a little bit of direct observation of verbal handoffs and time motion analysis. And these data are still preliminary, but at least at our first glance, um, really across the board, um, the quality of what was being transmitted in handoffs improved. You know, the severity assessment, action items, upcoming possibilities, in other words, contingency planning being discussed, and opportunity provided for questions and some synthesis. And we also found that with the nurses in particular, the frequency with which interruptions were occurring during handoffs fell off quite significantly after they um, started getting trained in this stuff. I, I think because they became much more attuned to the importance of having a a sort of sterile environment for the handoff, at least to the greatest extent possible, and not, not interrupting one another for this safety-critical event. Since the time of uh, these original studies being conducted, we've made a lot of efforts in the past 18 months or so to begin disseminating our work. Um, in fact, even before that time, we um, went live with our website, which is ipasshandoffstudy.com, where uh, most of the curricular materials that you have been um, hearing about for the past half hour or so are available uh, for free online. Um, all you have to do is sort of go into the website and click this request materials button that's up towards the top of the slide. And that will provide for you, um, we'll ask for just a little bit of basic information about you since we're trying to track what usage may be for this. And then you'll be given access to all of the materials. And we've also downloaded these materials or uploaded these materials rather on MedEd Portal, which is the peer-reviewed curricular website that's hosted by the American Academy of Medical Colleges. Um, as a series of modules, and so they're, they're accessible through that as well, if you prefer. Um, and we have begun to take a look at how things have disseminated. This is a little bit out of date. We're actually up close to 1,500 downloads now, but really, um, point of the slide is we're beginning to see some pretty broad uptake across, across the U.S., but at least to some degree beyond that as well, which is really exciting to see. And when we've looked at the breakdown of what specialties are using this, while well, certainly um, the largest slice here has, is in pediatrics, not surprisingly, since that's where we started. As Cliff was suggesting, um, with some of the adaptations that we have made across specialties, we're seeing um, really a lot of usage across across um, other subspecialties and across other disciplines as well with nurses and, and other folks in that left-hand pie chart uh, beginning to download the materials and use them themselves as well. Um, in addition to these initial dissemination efforts, we have um, launched a couple of new projects that, that have, have really begun with IPASS Roots. Um, we received some funding from the ACU for Healthcare Research and Quality about a, uh, just about a year ago now to study the dissemination of IPASS through 32 more hospitals, 16 pediatric and 16 adult, um, where we're, we're looking at what factors are that are associated with adoption and trying to track adherence statistics. This is being done in, in partnership with the Society of Hospital Medicine. And then we also received a grant from PCORI to begin taking some of these communication techniques that we have developed through IPASS and extending them into family-centered rounds and other communications with families throughout the day. And that's been a really exciting project that has gotten us partnering much more um, heavily with nurses, with family members, and others to think through how do we tailor some of this language to be appropriate to different levels of health literacy, people with different backgrounds, um, folks with different proficiency with English, and so forth, so that hopefully we can more effectively engage family members as active members of the patient safety team, if you will. We also, as I mentioned at the very beginning, have a consultation program now where we're working with a number of institutions that even outside of a study context have been interested in trying to implement this program. Um, Massachusetts General is probably the first, furthest along of the various hospitals we've worked with, where they're really in the process of implementing IPASS as a standard for uh, handoff communications across the institution, including both nurses and physicians, um, as well as all allied health workers. 
um, really for all different types of communication. And we're working very intensively with them to do some adaptations of our curriculum for that purpose and to train um, a, a very large number of nurses and physicians there. The, um, just want to end with a couple of thank yous before questions and answers. Um, the primary funding for this came from the Department of Health and Human Services. We've also had a lot of funding from other um, private and public sources to get this, to get this work done, um, for which we're really grateful. And as we move forward, we're, we have ongoing funding, as I mentioned, both from ARC and PCORI. Um, in addition, we'd just like to thank the other members of the IPAS team. Um, Cliff and I are featured in this photograph, but it's a large group, and this is really only a small fraction of all the people who are involved. There have been, um, with the IPAS study, the original IPAS study, there were about 50 investigators involved, and we, we're now up over 100 um, from across sites that are involved in this project, which has been just a fantastic group to work with. Um, and with that, uh, we'll stop and glad to take any questions. Thanks very much. Thank you guys both. That was really wonderful. Uh, very interesting, and, and as you can see, we got tons of people have been really interested and excited. Uh, if you look at the, the chat function that's been going on, I could say uh, probably without a doubt that that percentage of uh, the profession of uh, nursing using IPAS will probably go up after, uh, after this webinar because there's been a lot of questions coming in about uh, nursing staff using IPAS, so I was happy you guys had that later on in the presentation. Uh, somebody uh, brought up the question of, you know, if this handoff is being done uh, by staff at the bedside um, and with uh, patients involved or patients in the room, uh, what do you do to kind of overcome the challenges of perhaps nursing staff not wanting to do this in the room in front of others? What are some of the ways you've uh, approached that culturally. Sure. So, you, you know, it's, it's obviously a challenge. I think that raises uh, new barriers that we didn't really tackle in the original IPAS study, but that we have definitely begun to address now as we are working through the family and patient-centered IPAS um, project. You know, there are definitely issues of, of privacy of information if you're in a room with more than one patient. Um, but, you know, you know, I think we, we largely just do the best we can with that. It's been kind of the, the practical solution. Um, you know, try to be quiet. Try to, try to keep some confidential parts of the conversation maybe don't happen in that context. But most things, I think, are pretty amenable to it. You know, there certainly are some circumstances where, where it just doesn't work well. So, for example, in the pediatric world, if you are dealing with um, a child where there's really sort of difficult social situation, um, you know, adverse relationship between the parents, for example, some sort of legal situation going on, then things aren't going to fly well. But for the vast majority of patients, I think um, we have found that involving the families in those discussions and really having things be transparent at the bedside is a, is a win. Um, certainly, if you ask family members, the vast majority of them want that to happen. They want to be involved in those conversations. Um, at, at least to some degree, um, with, with some family members really feeling like there shouldn't be any conversation about their children that involves decision-making that they're not a part of. Um, others, uh, others obviously taking a little bit more of an arms, arms length approach than that. But, um, you know, dealing with the cultural challenges around how comfortable are people speaking, how comfortable are all of us as healthcare providers with that level of transparency is one of the real um, things that I think we have to work on as time goes by. And I'm not sure that we have fantastic answers yet, we're, but we're certainly beginning to develop some approaches. I'll just add to that, you know, at Walter Reed as well, we started uh, using IPASS on, our, on some of our nursing units, and I think the culture of the nurses actually um, uh, going from bedside to bedside to do their uh, handoff is actually somewhat different from the culture of physicians who tended historically to, you know, hold themselves off in a room someplace. So they are actually um, doing it uh, real time um, in the patient's room in, in most cases right now. We've developed um, a couple of uh, uh, videos, or actually a nursing video that I know the Massachusetts General Hospital Group is, is currently looking at as well, which we'll have available for a dissemination as well that goes through some nursing scenarios and how it might be utilized um, in the nursing setting. So staying on the idea of challenges or the topic of challenges, somebody actually just wrote in a question of wanting to uh, ask if there are a lot of challenges with the amount of time it takes for the IPAS handoff, uh, especially if you're talking about doing it at bedside. So, so again, you know, from the original study, at least, that was, that was probably the biggest source of concern as we began to roll this out. We were at the sweet spot, I think, in the medical culture and sort of the evolution of, I think, concerns about patient safety, where 
there really was pretty broad consensus that there was a problem with handoffs and that we needed to do something about it. But there was a real worry that this was just going to take more time and that that was going to make this infeasible. And fortunately, what we found is that that really was just not true. And I think being able to share that data as we have gone around um, from place to place and tried to spread the program has been has been really effective. But I think. Um, yeah, and I'll also add that you know we um, there was a lot of uh, trepidation among some of the other specialties here at Walter Reed when we said that they wanted to adopt it institution wide, particularly from the surgeons, for example, who are used to a very uh, you know a, a much faster sign up because they have a lot of more patients to sign out. And we've actually um, you know had the surgeons develop some scripts to show that they can do it quite efficiently using iPass in, you know, in the space of like 20 seconds per patient uh, along those lines. And so it actually, you know, we've left it up to um, the interpretation of individual uh, clinical services to determine how they would use it, but we found that it actually could be very uh, effectual and efficient at the same time. Thanks. Well, uh, changing gears a little bit, uh, you talked about uh, and just brought it up right there, the idea of spreading this to other units. I know you said you altered it somewhat for different clinical environments. Has there been any work on IPASS for uh, the transition post-discharge, uh, going maybe to a long-term care facility or just uh, back into the community uh, getting information to a primary care provider perhaps? No, it's, a, it's a really great question. It's something that we're actively thinking about right now, but it's not. Um, that's not an area that we've broached as yet. Okay, we've been thinking about it a lot. With those, uh, some of those changes, some of those alterations, even uh, what were was there something uh, like a major change somebody was curious about uh, between the ED going to ICU or the ED just to a normal uh, inpatient bed, how much does IPATH alter when you consider different settings? Well, I think, you know, Cliff should speak to this as well since he's a lot of experience doing this at Walter Reed, but, you know, my sense of it has been that the, the major thing that changes is what's included in the patient summary, um, what key data elements need to be transmitted there and sort of what the focus is for particular clinical disciplines in, in particular settings. The other framing elements, which are really about um, maintaining situational awareness, prioritizing the sickest patients, making sure that we're thinking about what could go wrong and doing the synthesis, those things work really pretty pretty well and consistently across across settings. Um, but, you know, the whole thing, I think, can kind of accordion up or accordion down, depending on the complexity of the patients and how familiar the various clinicians are with them. Yes, I'll add to that. You know, we certainly, so the way we did it here at Walter Reed was we enunciated in the hospital that this was going to be our standard transfer of care policy throughout the hospital, nursing, medical, from unit to unit on, you know, individual sign-out, whatnot. Now, of course, we need to operationalize that, you know, across multiple different clinical services, and that's very difficult. But as Chris said, I think, you know, already I think most clinicians are familiar with giving some degree of a patient summary, obviously, in an action list or what needs to be done. I think the, the, the kind of novel ideas here, uh, particularly in the IPASS um, bundle and the mnemonic specifically, is the idea of specifically stating illness severity, specifically stating a contingency plan, and the readback or the synthesis by receiver. And even that, we've already gotten our ER to, the folks in the ER to be able to utilize that when they're transferring patients to uh, the floors or to the units and so on. So it's slowly but surely getting there, but really it isn't so much of a quantum leap uh, from what's, uh, what they're kind of doing already. Thank you both. Um, I know that we are uh, at the top of the hour. There are other great questions that are here, and so uh, as uh, we said at the start of this, we'll, we'll make sure that these questions, uh, you know, we, we try to answer everything, and uh, we'll get this up on the teamstepsportal.org uh, within uh, a matter of, of days. It won't be right away, but we'll get it up. We'll also get a recording up of this presentation, uh, transcript so that you can share this with others if, you're, if others are interested in your institution watching it or, or reading the transcript. But I'd like to thank uh, both Colonel Yu and Dr. Landrigan for all of their work on this and for taking the time out to present to us today. That was a really wonderful presentation, gentlemen. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks. Thank Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's presentation. You may disconnect your phone lines, log off your webinars, and thank you for joining us this afternoon.